thank you for the opportunity from the Latismo community to allow, giving me the opportunity to share with you my research through the journey through mathematics into naval applications. I am Darlene Perez Levin, and I work there for the Naval Information Warfare Center of Atlantic. So one thing I would like to emphasize is the fact that all mathematicians come from different areas and backgrounds, and we all don't look the same. So <clears throat> something I really have learned is through the Latismo community is the fact that there are other people out there like me that do math research, but something also to note that um, we all have different journeys. I've met so many different people that uh, didn't come straight through academia, and it's been really interesting and exciting to hear about how they how they journeyed through mathematics. So I'd like to take the time to share a little bit about me and how I made it to where I am today. So I started by studying industrial engineering management at Purdue University. And actually, when I <laughs> was in the interview process, I interviewed for jobs in uh, IE management, and I hated them. So I <laughs> decided to interview for jobs in construction management and actually received a, a job offer and signed that job offer and then took construction management classes. So what I learned from this experience is that really you can take everything you've learned and kind of know how to revamp yourself to show that things that you have learned do apply to that new position. Um, this revamping was essentially that my family does a lot of construction management. My sister uh, at the time was working on the, the, accounting side. She now runs a painting company. My dad had owned his own painting company and does uh, operations for painting companies my whole life. And my sister was at the time studying to be an architect. So when I went to these interviews, I'm like, sure, I haven't studied this thing, but I know how to be a manager. And <laughs> my family has done this in the past. I grew up in this environment. I kind of have an idea of what this looks like. And apparently that worked. So if you're thinking that like what you studied is not a great, just figure out how to restructure that and pivot into something you want, which you'll later see that this happened again. So then I worked in construction management for about five years. And here I really wasn't felt, didn't feel intellectually challenged. I definitely wasn't bored. I had a lot to do. Um, I built in Cor uh, corporate interior spaces. So inside of a building, we gutted it, rebuilt it, uh, offices, office space. If uh, love concrete. So <laughs> if you're ever interested in talking about concrete, it's super cool. Uh, people make fun of me for that all the time. But that was, <laughs> I had the opportunity to go back to school and I went to Florida Gulf Coast University and studied uh, and applied, did their applied mathematics <clears throat> master's program. So my objective there, to be honest, was to get my master's and go back to work and uh, later on get a PhD in engineering, whether it was mechanical or electrical. My I really just wanted to do go back into engineering from a more research perspective. But then uh, the school didn't offer that the, that foundation that I really wanted out of a master's for that. So I decided to just do math because. I liked math and it seemed like an exciting thing to do. It was when I was younger, something that seemed uh, very approachable for me. I didn't really struggle a lot in math, but I did. Um, and I always enjoyed it. So I got into the master's program and then realized that pure mathematics is way harder. And I struggled a lot more, uh, but it was a really good learning process. And in the process, I'm sitting in Dr. Insko's linear algebra class, and I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to dive into this, I should just figure out what math research is. And he asked me the question, do you want something you can solve in six months, or do you want something that's going to take you two years during your master's? Um, I did. I picked the two years, and we did peak set permutation research, <clears throat> which involved uh, Dr. Pamela Harris, and that was essentially what really drove me to continue my education in pure mathematics. So at that point I was, um, they encouraged me to apply for PhD programs and I was accepted at the university of Kentucky and then decided to study number theory. Uh, when I was studying number theory, I studied under Dr. David Leap. I did plus minus Davenport constant. If you're not familiar with that problem, that's okay. It's a very 
it's a very select, <laughs> selective problem. But it's also like, I want you to understand that it's very, very pure, very, very number theory-ish. It's not applied in any sort of way. And here I am working in a very applied setting. Uh, so I loved working with Dr. Leap and I enjoyed doing research in that problem space. While I was at University of Kentucky, I realized that the academic world and the teaching world was not really where I wanted to end up. So I immediately started to network and transition and figuring out what are my opportunities as a mathematician. And also, is it okay that I'm studying number theory and want to do other things? And I was encouraged to just do and study what I want and just make sure that I take different types of classes. So I'm an algebraist, take an analysis class, right? I took numerical analysis and that whole series and sequence. I think I took a biostats class because I had the opportunity to do that. Um, just to break from the norm and be uncomfortable in a different area is really what they're looking for. So if you're out there and studying a pure degree, don't sell yourself short. You have a lot of value. And if the academic world isn't for you, you can easily transition to something else. So I immediately started applying to all these things. Um, I actually applied to the SMART Fellowship twice, and we'll get to that. I, the, <clears throat> I applied to the MSGI NSF internship program through the Department of Energy, and I was awarded a, a project with uh, Fermi Labs outside of Chicago for a summer. That same year, I was actually awarded the SMART Fellowship. It was my second iteration. I think I actually applied three times, but I didn't submit the first year because I was really, really shy about it. Um, but so I encourage you, if you're unsuccessful in these applications, submit again because you learn something by not making it through the first round. What do you need to change? How can you do that better? Um, I learned a lot by applying twice at the SMART Fellowship was successful the second time. So that fellowship is actually a Department of Defense. And what they do is they connect you with a research facility that they have for the department, for all the forces, Army, Air Force, Navy. I'm pausing because I don't know if Space Force is currently included, but um, there's a big list. You can Google it. It's pretty, it's pretty extensive. And what they do is they interview you, you submit a very long application, you go through an interview process, and then what happens if you're awarded, however many years of funding you get is however many years of service you're required to do. So I got three years of funding to finish my PhD work in number theory and then get hired by NYWIC Lant, Naval Information Warfare Center. And <clears throat> from there, I am now doing my years of service. So the great thing about this is I didn't have to go on the job market. And now I understand what it means to work for the DOD. I understand what it means to work for NYWIC Lant. I also know about various other opportunities out within my community as well as internally and just kind of get to do um, understanding that in a much more relaxed setting. So <clears throat> I am now at um, Naval Information Warfare Center, NYWIC Lant. And I have been working on applications of reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, logistical optimization problems, as well as some quantum information theory, which we will discuss here today. So to make reinforcement learning a little bit more approachable, we're just going to go through an example and how we approach it in game theory and then how we can actually take that example and build it through a grid game as well as a reinforcement learning algorithm. So we're going to go through what is known as a prisoner's dile dilemma. So Adam and Bob have robbed a, blank, a bank and have been arrested. They're being interrogated separately. Adam and Bob have the option to confess, move C, or to remain silent, move S. The police have little, little evidence, and if both remain silent, they will be sentenced to one year on a minor charge. Therefore, the police interrogators propose a deal. If one confesses while the other remains silent, the one confessing goes free while the other is sentenced to three years. However, if both talk, both will still be sentenced to two years. And if each other's pay so if each other's payoff is three minus the number of years served in jail, 
we get the following payoff matrix. So in this situation, this is, you can kind of see if they both talk, if they both stay silent, they essentially only have to serve one year. So they're like rewarded not serving two years, right? So if one of them talks at zero to three, and if they both talk, they really only gained one thing, one year less, right? So it's, it's kind of tricky, but this is like the reward, right? You get to spend less time in jail. And that's what you want to think about this. So this is what they are calling a payoff matrix. This can also be your utility matrix, spy matrix. And from here, you can actually split this apart into exactly how you would think this would be player one. And then you could split it apart as player two actions. So this later becomes important, but all of this, this is like a bi matrix that can then be separated. It's clearly much nicer when you think about it in these terms. Okay, so now we're gonna take Prisoner's Dilemma and we're gonna put it into a grid game. So here, it's the same idea, right? But here, we want all the agents. So you have agents A and you have agent B. And we want them to respectively make it to their goals at the same time. Now, if one gets into the goal and the other one is not, then you have that similar penalty. And then, so really, how do we get them to coordinate so that they both go to enter a goal at the same time? So in this situation, we have, uh, we create a grid. We create a center goal that's a unified. Both of them can step in. So see that they're both fighting to get in here but note that only one of them can get in there at a time. A has their respective goal on this side. B has their respective goal on this side. So for the objective here is to allow them to understand that one has to walk in this direction while the other one has to stay put and wait for the right opportunity to walk into this goal in the center. So the reason you see these different now below down here is that one is bribing the other one to say, hey, you stay and wait while I go walk over there. <clears throat> and this is essentially what a side payment would be. So now that we've introduced Prisoner's Dilemma in a grid game, we'll move on to. So remembering that example that we had from Prisoner's Dilemma, that, co that grid game, we're now going to explain how what algorithm we decided to use to start playing that game. So we started with a Coco Q learning in stochastic games with side payments. A reference is provided at the bottom of the slide. So Coco is just your cooperative and competitive value. That's what Coco stands for. And Q refers to Q learning algorithms. And then the side payment, you can think about it just as we described previously as a way to bribe other players to get to do what you want. So as A moved to their goal, they were bribing B to kind of stay put so that they could optimize that value together. To allow the agents to make these type of decisions, you kind of have to infuse them each step of the way. And the way they did that was doing by adding a max max and a min max value with your utility matrix per player. So you can think that by matrix, we split it apart. We recognize that for player one and player two. And the first thing we do is we look at that um, max max value. And that is your cooperative side. You want both players to optimize and achieve the best thing that they can do. But you also have to consider that neither player really wants to fail on their own. So they want to achieve what they want. And they also want to make sure that the other player does, you know, slightly less better. And that is incorporating competitiveness. So what Coco value does is it takes in that max max value, that min max value, divides it by two and adds it together to get you a particular value. So this becomes really helpful because now you can play a game, a cooperative game, right? In this sense, we're all on the same team. And you can say, hey, let's work together, but let me make sure I don't die. <laughs> so 
Now we'll jump into another example to kind of help see this through. So for the coordination game, really, we just want you to know, can you coordinate not bumping into each other? So in this game, what you're doing is you're just saying, okay, player A is down here and it's got to get to their respective goal up here. Player B is over here and it's got to get to their respective goal up here. Really, do you learn the agents have to go through and learn each step of the way that they like, oh, I just need to go to my goals. So when they're over here and they have to cross each other at some point, you need to make sure that they like, they're going to start doing what they did over here and go up. And then all of a sudden they're going to get to this point together, but they're not allowed to do that. And it's going to create chaos. So can the agents learn to coordinate that one of them has to go this direction while the other one goes the other way? And that is the purpose of this coordination game. And what you'll notice is that someone gets paid and then the other one gets rewarded. <laughs> so they're like trading essentially funds to say, it's okay. I'm going to my, you have to turn and I'm going to go straight, but like, it's going to be better. We're going to be okay. Now, the cool thing about using reinforcement learning is the agents really just walk around and they're stupid, right? Like <laughs> initially they're like hanging out, figuring out what's the right way. And you're infusing this reward structure along with these side payments. And they're really saying, this is more profitable. This was profitable last time. So I'm going to try that again. Now, when you do this in this type of structure to get that really good training, you're going to want to vary where you place those goals. And you're also going to want to vary where you place your agents. So let's say this is why changing this orientation while you're training the model becomes really important because you don't you want them to know that they will at some point have to avoid collision. So let's go over how they kind of work on tackling those previous structures and remembering that and how do they make decisions like where does coco actually come into play within these models so each step of the way as they're learning there's q value updates <clears throat> within these q value updates you'll notice that the the coco value is right here so you're starting at state space s and then you're searching for that state space S prime, which is your next state space. So you're going from state space S to S prime. And every state space S is tied to a reward. So you inject this cocoa value. And you're really trying to optimize and find that next best step. So this is similar to a Bellman equation. And it's tracked each step of the way for each individual player, which is kind of important. And it considers the next optimal action when given a function. In this case, what action would provide a new state space that will provide the highest payoff for both players? Because remember that we're working cooperatively and competitively. <clears throat> and recalling that every new, every action is tied to a reward. So there's like an action you need to take so that you generate the state space and that action itself is tied to that reward. So your alpha is your learning rate and your gamma is your discount factor. We won't bog you down with the details, but understanding that those are constants. So let's jump back to this. So as the agents are learning, they're making these Q updates and they're remembering what they've done in the previous. So I like to think about this as you're like generating a sequence that kind of sits just right here in each individual square. You have some sequence and that's going to print out a new value. And every time you make a step, you're like looking at your previous state space, looking at your future state space, reevaluating. And these Q value updates actually you can write this out and make those updates on these individual squares per player. It's actually a clever exercise. And we, we have our fellows that work on this project kind of like go through this learning process and really it, it's very intuitive to see these values increase. So these Q values are updated and create some sort of table and where it's successful, it literally paints the path of the most optimal value.
So what is the purpose of learning all this? Why do we even care? What does this even mean? How, like, okay, so I played some, you know, classical coordination game and a classical um, <clears throat> prisoner's dilemma, which are baby cases. And we really want to be able to understand those baby cases. But where do we want to go with this and why? So I'm a bit advocate uh, for board games. <laughs> I went from being a nerd to also being a geek. So it's really great. Uh <laughs> But this is a board game I actually own. It's called Burgle Brothers. And we we play this all the time. It's a cooperative game. There's like a cop that runs on each floor. There's up to three floors. You could play it with two floors or you could play it with three floors. And you are the robbers and you have special abilities. And while you, while the cop kind of like goes into this rotation, you'll notice that there's like walls that you can't travel between. Each tile has like restrictions and constraints so this is a motion detector and you have like self tokens so like the cop can sometimes catch you and the cop can sometimes not catch you um if you so the objective of the game is to uncover all the tiles because this is what the game looks like when you start and you have to figure out where the safe is add dice to the safe roll the dice and then get to the next floor and do the same thing and then get all the way out of the building so in this situation, we want to build a reinforcement learning algorithm that actually plays this game. Can we do it? I don't know. We tried. <laughs> so what we did is we actually included. So what we did was we actually included a. Um, we have a board. We have players up to two players. And uh, we, they got onto the board, they could flip the tiles. We didn't have all of the detection stuff that you see on here. So we did a variation of the game, like a very dumbified variation. I think we got to one floor. We started by a two by two grid and then went to three by three and got to four by four so they could like have more ways to travel. We figured out how to, you know, permute wise, essentially play the predictive what we know about very similar actions of what we know about the the cop as he travels around the board as they he would in the game and then we actually had actions so like you can move oh there's a wall there identify there's a wall there so now you can only move in this direction and also the fact that like when you get to the safe you have an opportunity to roll a dice or actually lay dices so you we injected some of the rules of the game and then we said how does Coco Q actually help us solve best methods and practices to play this board game? And it was actually kind of interesting. So limitations on this is you can put up to six dice on a save. And for some reason, like the agents uh, only wanted to put three dice and they just started rolling each turn. Uh, so it's like things that you can learn by creating this game that's a little bit more complex, like understanding limitations of codes, understanding limitations of their ability to as we extend that state that state space and that um action space per player right where does it break how long does it take to compute these are the types of things we want to really understand and where they have value as we inject them into naval applications okay so we described what we are looking at this larger case and, you know, we took a stab at trying to play a harder game and was slightly successful. But, you know, sometimes you learn and you crash and fail and that's okay. The next step we wanted to do was really jump to this multiplayer game. Now this becomes, so Coco Q is only solved for two players. Um, it is not solved for N players. And what we wanted to do is we worked with Dr. Alan Kunle at Texas A&M to really try and figure out end cooperative and competitive values for end players. So what does this mean for like baby games such as Prisoner's Dilemma? Well, this just means you have one central goal where everyone can stand and just as you would expect, right? Everyone has their own pillar that has their own goal. So someone is going to stay while the rest of them move out. And what we did is we are actually able to construct a Cocoa value that considers very similarly the cooperative and competitive values like Cocoa Q did. So to help build this complexity, we can actually play this turkey game. So this is a little bit more than the coordination game because you're allowing this probability gate. So like notice that player A was at this point at step one and two because 
you essentially roll, flip a coin and say, does this allow you to break free? But what the, what the model had recommendation was in this situation that while other people it recommended to go around the gate to get other goals, someone was going to have to do it. And in this case, it was player A. So they were not allowed to join this space. So turkey game is a little bit harder, but it's like a combination of adding that stochasticity into something like the coordination game where there's like multiple goals, multiple objectives and multiple players. So we are able to take our cocoa, val our, our cocoa and player values and uh, inject them into such a game. So what do these values actually look like? So here, before you saw that it was over individual utility matrix matrix so one for with an emphasis on one player or another right because that's the important part as these queue updates are happening they happen in such a way that the you like that minus sign on the competitive side, really, like if you're from perspective of the player. So like if you're player two, you're going to subtract your minimizing player one's value for that competitive side. But if you're player one, you're minimizing um, player two's values. So that's how cocoa values work. And in this case, we're doing the same thing. We're emphasizing at a particular player, but now we have to consider all possible subsets or what, what they like to call coalitions that are possible that include player I, which is exactly what this I here is. It's a subset of N where N is your, your set of players and you're iterating over all possible subsets here and taking that min ma the max min value <clears throat> for that game. Now this summation and um, inverse of a binomial function is actually called the Shapley value. So we are able to incorporate these max min in such a way and include the uh, Shapley value so that we don't get the like, we're like averaging out over, we're not over costing that payoff or like taking too much because we have that overlap in subsets of I. So this heavily well studied uh, value that is used for other N player games, we were able to inject it and use it here for a max max uh, max min similar to what you had in that cocoa value. Okay, so now we're going to break into the discussion of how this leads to logistical applications. So here we built autonomous reinforcement learning for cooperative handling and effective resources. This is a newer project. And what we did is we attempted to look at the setting and essentially figure out the the redistribution of goods like you would have, like Amazon has literally every day. Um, if you have a warehouse and you have a retailer and you have customers, how do you support everyone within that train? And how can we use reinforcement learning algorithms to provide that support given the understanding of a network? So what we did is how do we inject competitive and cooperative play into these types of models, and that is what we're currently researching now. So what we did here for this particular application was use a bidding structure. So there's like a payoff at each location of like, hey, I need this, and they throw a bid into the air. And those providing that supplies actually get to bid on that. And if you uh, submit the winning bid, you essentially add that to your delivery route. So this is a type of application that um, in diving into these reinforcement learning algorithms, um, we have ventured in and been able to utilize everything we've learned and build beyond that. So our objective here is not necessarily to use CocoQ, but to really understand how do we inject now in this bidding process, how does cooperative play work? How do we inject that in such a way that it's going to work with this bidding structure? And those are the types of questions we're aiming to answer with these types of algorithms. So bringing this all together, it kind of goes down to this traveling salesman problem. Now, if, if you're unfamiliar with this, this was originally proposed in the late 1920s. And then I think they were finally able to make a lot of progress in the 80s. And by the end of the 80s, they actually were able to solve this problem that's exactly presented in front of you here. All the cities and their capitals, 
a, a bunch of other cities. There's like well-documented code on like when they were able to compute this many cities. So if, you, if you're familiar with graph theory, this is essentially just finding a Hamiltonian cycle on a graph. And what you're doing here is you have some type of parameter variable. So in here, we could say we know the distance between this and this location. And we want to minimize the total distance traveled. So the reason it's the traveling salesman problem is like, let's say your salesman is out here in Texas. He's required to travel to all these cities. How does he do it by going there once and coming back home? This is a very exhausting trip. I don't think anybody would really want to do this. Uh, but hey, to each his own. So this is uh, quite interesting because it has a lot of applications. So when we think about logistics, that makes sense, right? Like Amazon warehouses is just smaller traveling salesman problems. And the exciting thing about this is that I actually started with this problem at Fermilabs. And the variation is we called it, um, I forget what it was called. It was like multi-agent -cir circus, traveling salesman circus problem, I think. And it's because they had like multiple, multiple locations. So this is like, your set of origins, and then you had your set of destinations, and then you had like some nodes, intermediate nodes. And the objective here was like, how do we find, given a set of origins and destinations, how do we find the best way to travel to these, situ these two crossroads? So the interesting part about it is, I don't know if you would expect, if you would lead to this, can conclusion is that what actually happens in these algorithms is that like there's only really two guys that pick up those those locations and then everything else just kind of like goes from an origin to a destination so why did fermilab um really want to answer this problem if you're not familiar they're a particle excel they do particle physics part of them they do a whole bunch of things but that's the department i was in so they do particle physics and they actually do like create particles, shoot them at things and visualize them and see them. It's very, very cool. So part of this is that these are actually different types of particles, the origin and destination. And then these are like smaller little particles that like all collide together and make these strings. And it's classically studied as uh, Lunden string theory. And what they wanted to do was simulate this and be able to look at this problem and kind of generate a recommendation of like what this actually looks like as a solution before they throw all these particles into the machine and seeing if they can actually estimate it. So why they wanted to do that? Well, they wanted to compare this LP algorithm, so linear programming algorithm, and they wanted to compare it to a annealing machine. Well, if you follow quantum computing, the annealing machines like they're hapless, they they're unproductive and I'm trying to be politically correct. They're unproductive and just like not really cost effective on how much effort and energy it takes you to drive to an answer than you really need. And then what is the process of getting to qubits? So those are like the gate-based quantum information theory problems, but it all starts with linear programming. So I went into this uh, halfway through my PhD program, um, well into number theory research, hadn't passed my prelims yet, but I went into this internship and I learned linear programming and I learned about particle physics <laughs> and I learned about that there's a translation between a linear programming algorithm and an annealing processor. And let's see what that looks like. It, like, can we take that foundation and just take it through these steps? So clearly this to here is, is non-trivial. That's, that's like a, a hard problem that people work on for research today. Um, but they were able to get from here to here given the efforts that we did during that summer. So it was kind of exciting. Um, I didn't get to run the system on the annealing machine, but the team did do it. And then I talked to them afterwards and it was kind of exciting to hear about how, how sad, well, it was, a, it was a while ago. So now we have more computing power and a lean, a annealing processes, but they also, you know, we're not going down that route anymore in quantum computing because like I said, it's just not cost effective effective. It is cost effective for economic problems, which is kind of cool. Anyway, side note, um, let's get back to the traveling salesman problem. So not only, are, so for, from a, a research perspective in logistics, our interest is like, what if we add airplanes and 
boats and like what if we add cars like maybe it's more effective to take a car over here than it is to just get on a plane and deal with airports and their time constraints and all that jazz so not not only are you considering the the distance parameters but you're injecting all these other variables and is that effective still in these classical LP programs. So now I'm working with a professor that's looking, he wrote a LP function to simulate the traveling salesman problem for applications. And then he looked at dynamic programming. And then from there, we want to actively compare this to how do we take dynamic programming and learn from and use that and compare it to a reinforcement learning algorithm that has all these objectives. So the nice thing about reinforcement learning algorithms is that like you can train a model and while your LP, your dynamic programming literally has a specific runtime, once I have a trained model, ideally that should be faster than what these classical methods are using. Now, we were discussing this earlier this week and we're saying, you know what though, like, is it really better? When is it better? Those are the types of things we're trying to answer. And then how do we cross? So like what's interesting about naval research is that you're just taking these observations that you're seeing from other entities and you're extending them in a way that's applicable to the Navy. So in this time, I've really had an opportunity to learn these classical methods, to work with people in learning these classical methods, make contribution um, out the gate. Can I code this stuff? No, but talk about, you know, Coco Q, it converges way cool. And the proof is super cute. So like, I didn't want to bore you with that proof, but it is like me understanding that value is, um, and injecting that theory <clears throat> is where I contribute to the team. Um, and respecting the fact that my teammates are computer scientists. They're going to, they're going to, code things a lot nicer and a lot better than I can. So how do we work together? How do we find that merriment and really make that progress towards that naval application? So I just wanted to end on a note that like outside of research, there is life to live. So um, I know when I love doing research, I like, you know, have a stack of papers literally everywhere. I'm a textbook junkie, but outside of that, I like to paddleboard and hike and play lots of board games. That was literally the choices for board games for dinner. I won't show you our, you know, wall of games, but it is very exciting. But it does, it, it does a little intimidate people. My dog and Charleston on her favorite beach. And then just like hanging out with my family, I had the opportunity to move to D.C. and I took it. So now I just kind of like get to hang out with Lincoln um, every now and then. And that's pretty cool. So uh, take the opportunity Take that space for yourself. Do the things you love. Um, give your brain a break because it will need it. Uh, thank you so much again for this opportunity to share a little bit about what I'm working on. And if you have any questions, even if it's about talking about how I transitioned from pure math into a very applied setting, or even how I went from number theory to learning reinforcement learning, sharing those those little tactics is is kind of enlightening to hear other people and how they uh, perceived and achieved that. So thank you for your time and have a great day.